Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Art Bietzheuvel. Uh, I'm currently working working for Google. I was at ARM therefore, uh, before uh, and at Linaro. Um, Ilias is also on the slide. He's in the front here. Uh, we collaborate uh, on some of the stuff that I'll be mentioning in these slides. Um, so I maintain the Linux EFI subsystem, so the EFI part inside the Linux kernel, and I also maintain parts of uh, OVMF, uh, parts of ARM support in Tiano Core, which is the reference implementation of uh, the firmware side of EFI. Uh, Elias is at Lanaro. Uh, I maintain the U-boot EFI. Yes, yes, he, he uh, works on the EFI implementation, not the Tiano Core one, but the U-boot one, which is like an alternative uh, firmware side uh, implementation of EFI. So I've been asked to give a bit of a status update to what's happening with EFI, uh, has been happening with EFI recently. And actually most of the EFI uh, discussions that are going on on the list for OVMF, uh, they're about confidential computing, which uh, is covered in uh, many different places, even at this conference at KVM Forum, which is on the other side of town. Um, I'm not really going to cover uh, any of that. Uh, it's but yeah, it's 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 uh, yeah. I should mention it because it's what I'm presenting is only a small part of the EFI work that's actually relevant at this moment. Um, so, I'm what I want to talk about is having uh, EFI support uh, as generic done as generically as possible, uh, and not have art specific hacks in either any of the layers. Uh, the confidential compute stuff is necessarily very art specific at the moment. And even though there are some parts and some discussions, uh, and I'm trying for OVMF to have the least amount of uh, art specific hacks. Uh, yeah, at this point, it doesn't really make sense to, uh, to cover that area. So, this is about the EFI boot flow. So I'm not talking about runtime stuff, but really about how you get from the firmware to loading the POS. So this is basically how the, uh, the specification defines it. So either you're running in the firmware and then you have abstractions to talk to the network, talk to the storage, load image, start image, uh, do all kind, uh, those kinds of things. Then there's the conceptual OS loader, which is actually defined in the EFI specification. Uh, that calls exit boot services, which means, okay, the firmware now goes away. And at that point, the OS loader is in complete charge of the platform and can do whatever it wants with page tables, memory, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but yeah, the OS loader is conceptually different from the OS kernel, and there needs to be some kind of ABI because there are two different components. Uh, so there's an, uh, an architecture OS specific kind of handover protocol between the OS loader and the OS, OS kernel. And this is basically what Itanium implements in Linux. So there's no EFI stub or anything that fulfills the OS loader role. That's that's kind of out of scope for the kernel support. It's just the, uh, the last block in this diagram, uh, which means that uh, necessarily there's some kind of specification or some kind of agreement on how these components uh, talk to each other. So on x86, uh, this was way before I was involved, but they worked around the, this requirement for a defined ABI between the OS loader and the OS kernel by just making it the same thing. So it means that the firmware calls, what once, as long as you're still running in the firmware, you use the five abstractions, you use the, the boot services as uh, intended, and then the OS loader is the, the, the EFI sub. And this is the component that calls exit boot services, and then it yeah, does it an internal handling to uh, branch into the kernel itself. Uh, and because it's basically the same binary, you don't need to define this internal API. It's just whatever this thing does to talk to itself is uh, is what the the ABI is. 
uh, yeah, so for x86, this is based on the legacy boot stuff. So there's a very interesting read in boot.rst in the documentation x86 directory where you can basically make an archaeological uh, journey through the through the, the history of Linux booting from a floppy and all these kinds of things. Uh, basically, that stuff is all there, and that's basically what the EFI stub uses to boot uh, the decompressor in this case. So not even the actual kernel, but what the legacy uh, x86 boot protocol defines as the first stage. Um, there were there are a, a couple of limitations with the EFI stub approach. Uh, one being that uh, the uh, the loading of an init rd if it's not done by the bootloader it's go it's done by the stub itself so you pass the name of the file to the sub and then the, uh, init R the stub goes looking for that file through the file systems but actually it can only access the the, the conceptual efi volume that the image itself was loaded from which is kind of deviates from what grub and lilo and those things were already uh, doing at the time So this was fixed. Um, yeah. So one way of fixing this that uh, the distro people implemented for x86 is to say, okay, we'll have a new protocol, AFI handover protocol. So while we're still running in the boot services and are supposed to run the EFI, use the EFI abstractions for loading a starting image. Uh, will rob will uh, use load image to load the image uh, it will set up this struct boot params x86 linux specific stuff to actually communicate where the init rd is and then instead of calling start image it will just branch to where it thinks the entry point of the image is and pass one uh, additional parameter uh, and yeah off you go so this kind of works uh, but yeah, it, it violates the specification, it violates the, the layering and the abstraction, so it's it's not great. And over time, it's yeah, becoming more and more problematic. Um, so one there's a, one other reason that I didn't put on the slide, but one other reason that x86 needs this is for mixed mode. Uh, so running at the x86 64-bit kernel on an x84 x86 64 bit cable cpu but one that was booted using 32 bit format and this is a very x86 specific problem we don't have that problem on any other architecture and for the same reason uh, well actually the problem here is that load image work works but start image doesn't uh, so there needs to be a different way to uh, evoke that image uh, so one problem with not using start image it's like the first yeah, kind of symptom that something is not entirely right is that uh, a boot service like Exit, which does like a basically does a long jump back to the the, the caller of the entry point, this stops working because start image does some things under the hood that no longer happen. Uh, so yeah, I'll get to that later. Yeah. So another issue with this is that. Uh, when I mean, Grub already knows this x86 uh, boot protocol, so it knows how to reason about. Oh, this image needs an init ID below four gigabytes, or this image does not, or the command line needs to be there in memory, or the, the, there are lots of crazy rules and uh, things that uh, Grub already implemented, uh, but which are necessarily now done by Grub, even though it's pretending to uh, do a EFI boot. gets worse uh, so there's the shim uh, <clears throat> and basically the problem that shim solves is also very x86 specific so uh, linux wants to run on x86 pcs x86 pcs are built to run windows uh, the vendors don't care about e5 uh, uh, they only care about what uh, uh, microsoft tells them to care about and then they'll get their windows sticker and it's all fine and actually the easiest way to comply with the secure boot uh, requirements is it just to only ever accept 
uh, Microsoft certificates and not remove the, the, the ability to disable secure boot or enroll your own certificates. Um, I wasn't involved in the discussions at the time, but uh, I think one of the issues with signing Rob was at the GPLv3. And generally, uh, yeah, it makes sense to uh, have like a separate shim, like a stepping stone that you collaborate on with Microsoft and not necessarily put that into Rob. So from, uh, from the point of view of solving this particular problem, uh, it's understandable how we ended up uh, in the situation that we ended up with, but yeah, it's not great. And uh, yeah, it's x86 specific. So we prefer to avoid it on other architectures. Yeah, so this is basically what we ended up with. So there are three, basically three different internal ABIs now. So there's the one with between Shim and Grub, there's the one between Grub and the uh, uh, OS loader, and there's the one between the OS, uh, OS loader and the Excel kernel. So the one on the right is kind of fine because that's after exit boot services, what the EFI spec defines as being appropriate for, yeah, doing whatever the hell you want. But the other two, they're basically violating the EFI specification by yeah, just putting stuff in memory uh, and uh, branching to it instead of using the proper abstractions. Um, so load image, there's a difference between loading an image and copying something into memory. Uh, especially with peak of uh, it's it's like elf it has described sections which have a file offset and a memory offset and it means you have to use the peak of header to construct the, mem uh, the image in memory uh, it's not uh, a one-to-one -one mapping uh, in principle even though the efi stop kernel usually is uh, we're running into issues where yeah the number of pages allocated uh, was uh, needs to be bigger than the size of the image. Uh, there's a BSS section that needs zeroing. Uh, there's you need ICAS maintenance to ensure that uh, the the code that you put into memory is always is also executable via the iSight uh, before you try to run it. So rolling your own load image, uh, yeah, uh, it results in uh, lots of issues that we've had to had uh, work around. Um, yeah, so for the shim grub side, uh, it's even a bit more hairy because it's, it's like works two ways. So shim exposes a protocol uh, and grub calls that protocol. And then shim also uses load image, I think, or it might, but it also has its own version. It also hooks. The existing one in the system table so when the other image calls load image it actually calls shop uh, uh, sims version uh, and the result is that basically and if if you want any of these components on the on the uh, on the distro you need all of them and this is what yeah ben, for instance, not the parts that distro specific right every distro has its own yes. yeah and every distro has its own grub parties it's not yeah, they generally have these have like yeah. 200 out of three patches, sure. and some of them are shared and some of them are yeah. different. But yeah, this is not upstream grub. This is really distro grub with lots and lots and lots of uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, changes. I have a patch uh, to, to fix the the problem there, but uh, I'll post it probably next week to the list for as an RFC because, of course, it is not the right thing to do, yeah. but it kind of solve the problem of requiring a shim for now. So. Uh, I'll send it to the grub list probably next week when I'm back. Ah, awesome. And this solves the issue where you... So basically the, the, the problem that Shim solves doesn't exist uh, in cloud uh, VM use cases or the UK use cases where we don't have the x86 PC problem, right? So Shim, uh, if the certificates that you want to authenticate against are already in the firmware, then grub should be able to authenticate against those directly. And I, this is what your uh, patch fixes, right? Yes. The, the, yes, but it does it in a convoluted way due to how Grub structures its verifying thing. So we're still not properly doing load image, start image the way we should, mm. uh, because it's just a verifying hook that verifies the image by loading it from memory to memory. Right. Yeah. Basically, long story short. Mm. It works. 
it does a job for now, but I don't think uh, it, we should still have the general discussion, how can we do better? Uh, can we just have shim hook load image that we, and, and just rely on that and always yeah. use load image in Grub? I mean, they, there's a whole conversation here that needs to be had uh, to, to, to do something better. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So one thing I didn't mention here, uh, load image is also, uh, and this is actually like defined in the TCG spec, like the cost computing spec, that load image is actually what under the hood will uh, do the authentication, but also do the measurement into the TPM. Which means that if you're going to roll your own load image, then suddenly you have to reason about, oh, does this need, if I, am I on a platform that does measurements? What, uh, what is the policy? And if it's just pure uh, TCG uh, measured boot for EFI as it is defined, then it's all fine. But now with uh, confidential computing, we have like, we'll have four different ways of doing attestation and measurement. And now all of a sudden, load, load image uh, has to has to be aware of, oh, this could be DICE at the station. Oh, this could be DRT, DRTM. Oh, this could be... So basically by by, do, by uh, violating the layers like this, uh, yeah, the, we're opening a can of worms that uh, really should be closed. Okay. Uh, where am I going? Ah, okay, yes. So, some of the work that we've actually been doing, uh, Ilias and I, uh, over the past, I think, two years already, this like slow. Uh, yeah. Um, so, the EFI handover protocol, we don't really need that. Um, mixed mode is not the problem on any other architecture. And actually, I have a fix for mixed mode, but uh, it's like fixed in OVMF and uh, in the kernel. And, uh, but for, for, yeah, for generic EFI, we don't even have to mention it. Um, so what we did is just have a protocol, like the AFI way of exposing functionalities via protocol. So you just expose a protocol that gives you an init RD. Uh, so if you define this in the firmware, in the loader, or whatever stage runs before the kernel, the EFI stuff, all it has to do is see if this protocol exists, and if it uh, exists, call it. And then all these... Uh, limitations about oh i have to reason about where it can be loaded oh, i have to yeah uh, no art specific rules about placement etc uh, it goes away because it's the efi stuff that actually allocates the memory uh, and is in charge of uh, handling it and the protocol just gives you the contents so this is in uboot in the efi stuff the grub patches uh, after a long time are now uh, on their way in. Um, I think system D boot or system D sub one of the two has an implementation for that. Um, yeah, so this is basically yeah, and and uh, Risk Five doesn't even enable the init or the uh, command line loader. It only uh, EDK two has an implementation as well. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Um, another thing we did, uh, Elos did actually was. Uh, so the EFI stuff, and this is actually something that occurred to me when I was in the confidential computing uh, microconference this morning. So currently, uh, we measure the init RD. If, if you use load file 2, we'll measure it into PCR9 if TCG protocols are available. Uh, we don't do that yet for the command line. And actually, the TCG spec, strangely enough, doesn't reason about the command line or the, the load options, as EFI calls it, uh, at all, which is kind of an oversight. But uh, yeah, we'll be adding that uh, yeah. soon. The only thing we have to uh, take into account here is what I just said about uh, different kinds of measurement for uh, different kinds of uh, confidential computing environments. So I'd really like the TCG protocols either to be implemented by all of those so we can just yeah. call it and don't care about it or have an alternative TCG Lite, TCG3, whatever, uh, that all those firmwares can implement in their own way and then leave EFI stuff. Yeah, so basically this has to be a callback to the firmware. The stub has to call measure that yeah. and the firmware needs to understand what am I measuring where. Yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly. So we'll tag it with, oh, this is yeah. a bit this is a command line, but beyond that, uh, up to the implementation, you reason about it. Um, yeah, another thing I did recently that was inspired by the Lungarch stuff uh, is uh, have a 
yeah, basic EFI decompressor. I mean, ARM64 doesn't have a decompressor because basically you need to set up uh, a completely different runtime, uh, map the memory with cache attributes, uh, do other things, uh, run the decompressor. It's 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 a bit. Yeah, it's a lot of work for not a lot of gain. Uh, EFI, however, is a very high level runtime already. So if you can just run an EFI app that decompresses something and load that using load image and start it using start image. Uh, yeah, basically all the ARC specific stuff goes away. So this is uh, send a V5 the other day, which enables this for ARM64, RISC-V and Long Arch with, yeah, maybe five lines of per arch code and everything else is, uh, is uh, generic. <sighs> Let's show uh, that. Yeah, so this is basically what we want, uh, what I want, and what I think is the best for, for having generic uh, EFI boot support. So the dotted lines uh, are optional components. So if you install your distro and your distro installer notices that the distro certificate is already in the firmware, it doesn't even have to install shim. Or if you're not on x86, you don't have to install shim. Uh, and yeah, if you want Zboot, you get Zboot, but you can also remove it. It's all using the, the APIs as the spec defines them. I think that's <coughs> all I had. Yes, that's all. Uh, any questions? Just so. Yeah. <laughs> so so when, uh, when you're talking about new architectures, do you mean uh, using UEFI on architectures we already support in Linux or using it as the only boot protocol for architectures we don't yet support? Um, so are you asking if, if, if other existing architectures will gain EFI support or should gain EFI right, support? Like, uh, yes, um, like, like what, what your goal was, because there are not so many architectures we are, we're still merging. <laughs> are, I'm always saying, well, this might be the last one. There's probably three yeah, or no, four more. Right. I'm, not, I'm, I'm not necessarily reasoning about, uh, the future here, but more about why, uh, the, 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 the motivation around some of the recent work and why it's important to keep things uh, generic and basically the zboot stuff is a case in point where oh it's all generic code on the uh, on the, uh, the firmware directory and uh, the arch only needs to change its make file to actually uh, wire it up um yeah i don't see i mean existing architectures that use something else yeah uh, yeah it's up to them if 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 and, and well basically i want this to be rooted in the spec right so uh the efi spec doesn't have any other architectures so uh i would expect those uh to be introduced first so we can actually see whether what they're doing uh, complies with the spec uh, but yeah if people are interested in doing that uh, it's perfectly fine there was a question there Done. So uh, what I was wondering is how coupled is Zboot to the kernel image itself? Like, can you take Zboot? Sorry, I can't hear you. Can you talk more into the microphone, please? Can you take uh, Zboot and apply it to an old kernel image and combine the two to make it work? Mm. Or does it depend on changes in the kernel itself as well? I think you could backport the patches quite easily. Uh, it doesn't really rely on anything uh, recent yes but without is it possible without any backporting so we built set boot and then we combine it with an existing kernel image would that at uh, all be possible yeah yeah if you if you take break out the patches and 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 make a standalone thing out of it uh, you can easily uh, uh, compress any efi app that you want mm -hmm. uh, yes ben yeah. uh, thanks so Zboot just uses load image, start image, right? Yeah. Which means, ah, so uh, on the wrong architecture, you still have the shim problem. Yes. Uh, 
I know you. I saw you had some slides you skipped over about the whole hooking of load image yeah, and start yeah, image. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you don't, maybe you don't have time. Uh, is there a path here to, to, to get rid of the shim lock protocol? Because uh, fundamentally, even if we hook load and st image and start image from the shim, we still have to do an implementation that does not call the real ones because the real one won't be able to verify the image regardless, yeah. which kind of defeats which kind of brings us back to the same problem where the real load image and real start image that might do some magic we don't know about yes. are still going to be skipped. So, so I mean, the fundamental... and sorry, just to finish, <laughs> and do we think we have the ability maybe to work with UFI to solve that in the long term by actually uh, adding a mechanism or a way to register protocol with UFI for alternate type of verification or I mean, what, whatever mechanism we can think of that is reasonably safe. Yeah, so, so first of all, uh, all of this runs privilege, right? Yes. So even if, uh, even before whatever stage is running calls exit boot services, it's in complete control of uh, the platform. It can change mappings, uh, do things with interrupts, uh, uh, anything it wants. So it means that Loading an image and getting like an uh, uh, authorization authentication violation back. Uh, does it really help to prevent that image from being executed? Uh, sure, but as when we discussed that yesterday, yeah. um, if load image internally fails, it might not do things like I don't know cache management or something that might be needed. So we, we still end up in this gray area and we still end up outside of the spec and we still no, end up... No, it's not entirely like that. Uh, so load image, uh, it's documented behavior when it returns an access violation is that the image is not unloaded. So for every other error that occurs, the image is never loaded and you don't get a handle or anything. For this particular error code, it says, okay, the image uh, is, uh, you get a security violation mm -hmm. but the image the handle is valid the image is there okay so basically because because the, whatever is running could still execute or do whatever it wants does it really help to prevent the, uh, the start okay. image call from succeeding uh, as long as the implementation of uefi doesn't do something that causes start image to fail in that case okay fair enough uh, i would still love to see things spelled out in a spec yes. so that enabled us to do these things uh, in a way that we know is solid, we know is going to work down the line. Yeah. Uh, well, at the moment, we're kind of playing a little bit with fire, and, and we have those assumptions baked in, which is not great. Yeah, no, I agree. And uh, the next to present.